thought I would uh, give a little bit of a, a little historic history of, of Newfoundland when mm -hmm. at the time when I was growing up. So that, because a lot of people don't know that much about Newfoundland, you know? It's, yeah. Uh, so I thought I would uh, start like that. And I would love it if you have questions and interrupt me as we go along, if something comes up that you'd like, because that'll open it up for me as well. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So now I don't know. Uh, I guess this is how it'll be. Uh, I should pin myself, I guess, so that I'm in the video. Yeah. Have, yeah, I'll be. I don't know if that works. I. It says remove pin, so that's not working. So I don't know that's you. That's hide thumbnail. That's no, that's nobody. That's just me and you. So I don't know, do we want to leave this like this? Well, we can if we want to. That's I don't know how else to do it. Okay. Okay. So I'm calling this my St. John's, although the only thing about this part of St. John's that is mine is uh, the Cabot, <laughs> the, uh, the Cabot Tower, the Cabot Tower, because everything else here has grown. There were no mm -hmm. big buildings like I believe that might be the hospital there in the background. And there mm -hmm. were no big buildings like that in 1959 when I was there. Yeah. But, There were certainly uh, this type of uh, scenery with boats and little harbors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now for me, I just thought I'd let people know that Newfoundland was originally settled by Indians and Inuit. And uh, it's the first European, the first Europeans to set foot in Newfoundland, I believe, were the Vikings. Yes. And um, it was officially discovered by the Europeans in 19, 1497 by John Cabot, who then mm -hmm. claimed it for England. Mm -hmm. It's funny to hear all this background because when you get to Newfoundland, you have all this Irish lilt and you think everybody must have come from Ireland at some point, but it's just the way the, uh, the Newfoundland way of yeah. talking is so welcoming and so joyful in the way it, it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people should know that Newfoundland was a dominion it had its own army, it had its own monetary system, it had its own stamp, and Memorial University had already been founded in 1925. Mm -hmm. And it became the 10th province of Canada in 1949. Yeah. But this picture here is kind of a picture of what Water Street looked like um, on the corner here, they used to often be fishermen with cod or seal flippers that were being sold. For me, oh, coming, wow. from, coming from Ottawa, this was quite unusual, but quite often uh, in early mornings, you could go buy very fresh fish right on the corner here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Joey Smallwood is the person who brought the Dominion of Newfoundland into Confederation in 1949. Now, I was born in 1932. So in, in 19, let's see, at that time, I was living in Ottawa. I was 16 years old and I was in high school. Okay. And the news of Newfoundland becoming a province was like the news of COVID today. It was on the radio all the time. Now we didn't mm -hmm. have television then, but it was on the radio because I, I think you might even still know Newfoundlanders know there was a big controversy. And yeah. Newfoundlanders did not want to join Canada. 
and really Canada didn't want Newfoundland to join. And yeah. although a lot of people don't like Joey Smallwood, it was Joey that brought the Confederation together. It was due to his work wanting Canada, uh, Newfoundland to be a province of Canada that made it happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, this is what people thought Newfoundland was all about. They never <laughs> thought Newfoundland was developed. They thought Newfoundland was a rock in the middle of the ocean. And mm -hmm. uh, especially Nova Scotians. Because oh, really? I, yeah, I was living in Nova Scotia at the time that um, we were given the posting to Newfoundland. And mm -hmm. Nova Scotian people, why would you want to live on a rock in the middle of the ocean? <laughs> uh, by this time, I had, well, I'd been married in 1952 and we were, had been posted to British Columbia, to Victoria. So my mm -hmm. first baby had been born in Victoria in 1952. It was the first time I had been near salt water. Okay. Because, uh, although in Victoria, we call it the ocean, but it is just the Strait of Juan de Fuca. It's not the actual Pacific. Yeah. So then when we went, we went from, from BC to Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. and I saw the Atlantic, and now we were being sent to Newfoundland, which was yeah. going in the middle of the Atlantic. So for me, I was very excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did not think negatively about it. It was just going to be uh, something exciting happening in my life. So mm -hmm. here we are in Nova Scotia. It's, it's the winter of 1959, and I have my three children here, my oldest daughter, my second and my third, and my son here, because I was mm -hmm. pregnant for my son there, and we are leaving Halifax here to, for our big adventure to Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. I was young, and... Uh, How old were you there when you... Okay. I was married at 20 in 1952, so I'm 27. Okay. Okay. So everything is very new to me. The world is very new and I love traveling. So, but mm -hmm. when you think of it today, people have one baby and find it hard to cope. I had to pack for three babies here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so there was a lot of uh, work that we had to do that mm -hmm. did it because we had to do it. So of course, 1959, we were able to find this apartment right here at 114 Cornwall Avenue, which mm -hmm. was a semi-basement apartment. Mm -hmm. And the crossroads was Road Deluxe, which is now called Waterford Bridge Road. Yeah. And there was a candy store right across the street on Topsail Way. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and my daughters used to like to, they were, when they were big enough to watch for the traffic, run across the street and go buy candy at this candy store. Can't remember the lady's name though for me. It's right there at the tip of my tongue and she was a really neat lady. But yeah. here we are, and as you can see, we still had mail de and milk delivery in those days. Okay. So there's the bottle of milk the milkman mm -hmm. used to bring to our door. And this is a picture that we had of the big snow. I mean, we, mm -hmm. were, we were welcomed into Newfoundland uh, very uh, royally with one of the biggest snowfalls that they'd <laughs> ever had, okay? Yeah. And this was February, 1959. So I wake up in the, what I thought was the morning by a phone call because it's very dark and quiet mm -hmm. and nobody woke up. The children hadn't woken up. Nobody had woken up. And I pick up the phone and my neighbor says, are, are you okay? And I said, yeah, but there's no electricity. 
And I said, it, it must be really early in the morning. She says, no, it's after lunch now. Wow. But she said, it, and uh, she said, do you have candles or anything? I said, no, I, I don't have anything like that. So she said, well, go into the bathroom. And if you pull out the, uh, the metal around the pipe under the sink, there's a hole there that leads into my basement and I will shove some candles into you through the hole. So <laughs> she, uh, she handed the candles out to me through the hole and we lit some candles and saw that it was later on in the day and the neighbor, they were able to jump out of their one of their windows and shovel mm -hmm. out their front door. So they had come over to our place and shoveled out our front door and uh, brought us a, a kettle full of boiling water so we could at least make Lipton noodle soup, you know, <laughs> something mm -hmm. that you would just need to pour boiling water over, at least make a cup of tea. Yeah. And yeah, we were uh, really supported by the neighbors because we, for us all, this amount of snow was an enormous amount of snow. Yeah. Now you just had a big snowfall this year. Mm -hmm. So was Corner Brook affected by that large snowfall? Um, St. John's was, but not Corner Brook. It's funny, St. John's gets it and Corner yeah. Brook, yeah. Usually we get it, but St. John's doesn't, but this year it's, it was it St. John's. Yeah. Yeah, so there's our car. Wow. And uh, of course, the snow seems to build up with the wind and that. So it seems like you get more and more snow. And of course, we were told we couldn't, uh, we, you really couldn't let the kids go out to play in the mm -hmm. snow because uh, I'm going to put this over here. Um, because of the air holes that happened that they might fall through. So this was a few days after the snowstorm. And they're mm -hmm. my three little ones all enjoying the snow. And the funny part of this is that uh, the, uh, let's see, I, I see some stuff here. Oh yeah. When, when, if we went to the backyard, the, even the little ones, uh, this one here was only in grade one, so she must have only been six years old. You could, yeah. you could touch the clothesline. Mm -hmm. The snow was so high they could touch the clothesline. So uh, this is was unforgettable for me. I was used to hanging my clothes out in the winter and having it freezing because in in Ottawa we do get cold winters. But I yeah. have never experienced fifty four point nine centimeters of snow which was a heck of a lot. Yeah. My first uh, very important uh, experience in Newfoundland was the snow. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I found, and maybe you're used to this, but once spring came, the snow was gone within a week. Yeah. And it didn't take a long time for all this snow to go away and for summer to come. It, mm -hmm. I don't know, St. John's is built on a hill and it seemed like all the snow just melted, ran down the hill back to the ocean. So yeah. <laughs> it, it was quite an exciting time for us to yeah. be able to experience the weather in that way. The other thing for me that uh, I survived well being in Newfoundland, and I don't know if I would have survived it that well otherwise, is that I had many, many visits to St. Clair's Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a great big beautiful white hospital there, but when I was living there, it was a very old and small little hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, as I say, I was pregnant and uh, I think it's important here to mention that my baby was born July the 12th. Well, don't yeah. forget, we had arrived in, in our house there 
late January. Well, by April, I hadn't really gotten out very much because of all this snow and my pregnancy and all that. Mm -hmm. But my neighbor organized a shower for me. Okay. Yeah, and it was one of these potluck showers. When I, I discovered potlucks in Newfoundland because potlucks are real potlucks. They're not mm -hmm. organized, they're not planned. Just people bring what they've got. Yeah. And, and my, my neighbor had organized a potluck shower for me. Mm -hmm. And I had to be introduced to everyone who came to my shower. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just unreal. It's just unreal that the neighbors came brought me beautiful gifts, made yeah. me feel so welcome. I, uh, the whole time I lived in St. John's, I was very far away from my mother and my sisters, but I felt at home because there yeah. was a real feeling of love, of love and friendship. It seemed to be always there. It was never, never, uh, it was never a time when I felt there was nobody there to help me. You know, it was, it was always there. Yeah, the Newfoundland hospitality like was is still it's here. still there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's my my little my first boy. And of course there were blueberries to be picked in the by August. So he was born mm -hmm. in July. And like I told you, he was born on the 12th. Well, mm -hmm. the other funny part of this is. Uh, the lady I was living with, Edith Wareham, it was her house, her father was a very grand person in the Orangeman's Lodge. Okay. And of course, a big celebration is July the 12th, mm -hmm. the glorious 12th of July. And she was pregnant too. And they wanted their baby to be born on the 12th as a very... Mm -hmm. Uh, a special thing and so the race was on and I won so I had my baby on the 12th she had hers on the 13th and the big joke was my my husband was in the Knights of Columbus then and oh you're going to get kicked out of the Knights of Columbus for having a baby on the 12th of July mm -hmm. uh, this I, I knew these things were going on but like I was born in Ottawa and we were never involved in so much this orangeman and catholic stuff that had happened yeah it was funny to be to be experiencing that mm -hmm. so let's see now yeah so here's a picture of my husband with our first son michael and uh, the background belle isle mm -hmm. and um my mother came to visit us shortly after the baby was born and she went swimming in the ocean for the first time in her life and she was just loved it. Wow. We, some wonderful, wonderful memories of, of Newfoundland there. Mm -hmm. But Michael became sick at about three months old and had to be put in isolation. And this is a picture of him when he came home. Okay. Now, while we were in Newfoundland, the queen came to visit. Okay, so uh, of course they paved Cornwall Avenue, hooray, hooray. <laughs> because uh, it, it, it had been paved, but I mean, it wasn't in a good shape. And yeah, uh, repave it for the queen. Mm -hmm. but, and what they did was, and this is funny, and I, I checked Google all over to see if they had made note of it anywhere, but they didn't. They built a big cage in Bowering Park and they caged a moose. Not, okay. not for a long period of time, but for the time the queen was there. So mm -hmm. they could go and look at a moose close up. <laughs> and so I heard they, they paved Cornwall Avenue. I never heard that story before that they, they made a cage for a moose. They made a cage for a moose and and it had to be a temporary cage because nobody would agree that it would be there for a long time. But mm -hmm. I remember bringing the children there and we all had a close look up at the moose. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. could go in. It was at the park, but it was there particularly for the queen to see a yeah. moose. 
And once wow. the, they, once the thing was over, they, they freed the moose and, but nobody made note, note of that, I think, because really uh, animal people didn't particularly like the fact that there was a moose yeah. in the cage. Yeah. It, it was a, a funny thing. And of course, m my husband was in the Navy, so uh, and we had a lot of Navy picnics and that. So here's Michael has just learned how to walk and he's won the race. So we're all quite proud of him. And mm -hmm. that's my second daughter here. And this is me here. You can see very young, very young, inexperienced lady here. Mm -hmm. Now my daughters joined Romper Room and you told me that the Romper Room still exists. Well, uh, I used to watch it uh, and I loved it um, when I was a little um, preschooler. So I think I have one of those uh, diplomas too. You have one of those diplomas. Well, Romper Room was just starting mm -hmm. and they had uh, contacted my, my, my neighbor, uh, Edith Wareham, uh, about trying to find children that mm -hmm. would be able to come. And actually my older daughter, uh, Lucille, really, you'll see her later, we called her Titi. She was the first one to go to Romper Room. And oh. then, then the next, uh, t after so many weeks, they uh, wanted more kids. And so uh, my, my little one, let's see. I'll go back to there. Uh, Diane, Diane came, and this was Miss Eileen. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm sure it's a different one now. And they had a magic mirror. They must have had that in your day too. Oh yeah. And they were very, very. It was something my children's. There, uh, my these children are now in their sixties. Okay, mm -hmm. and so uh, they still remember romper room, very. Uh, in a very happy way. Yeah. She was very keen on like writing them letters. Here she had written a letter to Lucille. We called her Lucille Marie, that's her full name. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had broken her leg and she wrote a little message to her about her leg. And oh. then inviting her to come to the next sessions. And in this uh, letter here, Diane had, uh, Diane was playing with her brother, with her sisters at home, and they were playing with some cocktail mixers, plastic ones, and mm -hmm. one of them got thrown and hit her in the eye. And oh, so, wow. yeah, we had to bring her again to St. Clair's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a measles epidemic, so they, she had had the measles as a young baby, so they were able to take her in and mm -hmm. put her in the ward, even though all the kids had measles in the ward. Yeah. That they kept her there a couple of days to make sure the, the injury to her eye was uh, not serious. Yeah. And uh, so here, Miss Eileen writes a letter, a little letter to, uh, I don't know if they're that, uh, if they do this anymore, but in those days they were very attentive. And mm -hmm. she writes a letter to Diane about and asking her to open your eye is better. And it was really nice because then I got the kids to respond, you know, because they'd gotten a letter, so they had to write back. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was a great, uh, and they remember it really a lot. So here's TT with her plaster cast here. Because as you saw in the first picture, we lived on the bottom and there were steps going up to the top to go into the house. Well, yeah. the kids had to show off and jump one step and then two steps and three steps, you know, just to see how mm. smart they were. Well, of course, this one wanted to show off and went up to the top step. And oh. yeah, and broke a bone in her foot. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we had to bring her to the hospital. And 
in those days, you know, we're talking 59 here, black doctors were not kind of common anywhere and certainly not in Newfoundland. And black yeah. women doctors were certainly not ever seen in many places. But it just so happened that the doctor that was uh, seeing to Lucille's cat, to Titi's cast was black. Okay. And she, she's always been a very bright, smart little kid. And so she looks at the doctor, an embarrassing moment for me, mind you. She <laughs> looks at the doctor and she says, the nun in school told us that we were made from dust. And the doctor's, you know, agreeing with her. She, she looks at her and she said, well, I guess you must have been made from mud. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready to faint. <laughs> but she had a good sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there were so many little things like that that happened, you know, that just uh, made, made the difficult situations a little bit better. So here mm -hmm. they are, there's, uh, only, there's only 15 months between these two. Okay. And yeah, so there's the cast on her leg. So mm -hmm. I had to push her down Road Deluxe to bring her to, the, to, bring her to school because uh, the, she and her older sister they were going to Little Dale College. I don't believe Little Dale College is still there. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's something else. At least my my Google search, I couldn't find Little Dale College as a building there. I just found that there was a Little Dale College. Mm -hmm. It was run by the nuns. And okay. uh, yeah, I'd had, uh, Lucille was like, Helen was in grade one, and uh, I will go on further to tell you that my husband had had an accident and was in the hospital, and I then I'd gotten pregnant for a, fourth, a fifth child. Mm -hmm. So I brought, I went to the, uh, the nuns and I asked her, would they take Lucille in kindergarten, just mm -hmm. so that I would have one less child to deal with at home because I had enough things on my plate here to deal with. Yeah. So they, they took her in, um, it was midway, it was January. They took her in January, 1960. Yeah, and they said, but in the, in the summer, in, in September when school started again, she would have to stay in kindergarten and I agreed. But when school school started again, they put her in grade one. Okay. She was smart enough to keep up with them. So she's always been a year ahead of herself. Yeah. In school, which was not a good thing. But for me, it was a good thing because it meant she could go to school full time. And mm. she was a really, really busy little girl. And that gave me a, a chance to have a bit of a break. Yeah. So this was at that, again, 1960. This is my oldest daughter, Helen, and she made her first communion at mm -hmm. Littledale College. Now, Helen was born in British Columbia in Victoria. Helen was, okay, yeah. she was baptized in Victoria and she made her first communion in St. John's, Newfoundland. So. This is Navy life, you know, and all the moving we had to do. Yeah, it's uh, right across the country. Yeah, yeah. And the funny part of it is, too, that here she made her first communion at the chapel at the college, because it was a nun's chap a place and there was a chapel. And when Michael was born, he was born, he was baptized at the chapel of St. Clair's Hospital because they made sure the little Catholic children were baptized before they left the hospital in case, like, in case they lived in far places like maybe Bay Despair or places like yeah. that where there might not have been a church. Yeah. So, I was thinking when I was thinking of this the other day and I don't even remember what church we went to. 
there must have been a Catholic church and maybe I never had time to go to church because uh, my kids were, uh, they all did their things either at school or at the hospital, but they must have gone to church sometime. But mm -hmm. I can't remember where the church was. Okay. It, like uh, my memories of Newfoundland, there were, was always a church somewhere. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there must have been. But you know, in New Newfoundland in 1959, there wasn't mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. One movie theater in St. John's and they mm -hmm. changed the movie once a month. Uh, yeah. yeah. And there was one uh, television channel that was the CBC. So I learned how to enjoy boxing and hockey because that's what it was. Mm. And you had the CBC radio. And in the winter, because there were so many little ports and places in total isolation that people used to communicate with each other through CBC radio. Mm. So if you wanted to talk to your mother, you, you, people got together through the radio station you can actually hear you could actually hear them talking to each other. It was definitely not private, but <laughs> at least they could get a hold of each other. Yeah, yeah. It's so different funny. times. Yeah, because today with cell phones, you wouldn't think of that. Yeah, and they were so isolated in their in their little community that the only way they could let people know that they were okay, that they weren't sick, or that they were sick was to communicate from the CBC would, would connect people together then. Yeah. So that this was strange, just for me then, it was just as strange as it would be for people today, because mm -hmm. I came from Ottawa where we never had so but somebody in such isolation, you know? Yeah. But it's funny to think that in 1959, there were still many parts of Newfoundland that were very isolated. Mm -hmm. When my, my mother came, I told you at one, some, some point in 1969, my, my sister, my oldest sister and her two sons and my mother decided to drive across Canada from Ottawa and mm -hmm. come and see me in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Like I say, Newfoundland was a thing because we we were in Ottawa and we'd heard so much about Newfoundland coming into Confederation that my family wanted to see what it was like also. <laughs> so they drove through and went through Porto Basque mm -hmm. and to Corner Brook. And yeah. they had to drive then across from Corner Brook to St. John's. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what it's like now to drive from Corner Brook to St. John's. I'm sure you've got a paved highway. I'm sure it's there much are better, yeah. motels and a few rest stops along the way. But in 1960, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. And they didn't realize that when they left home. And so in night times coming and they, they're on a gravel road it's taking more hours to get to St. John's than it does now. And they've got no place to stay. They expected to see motels and stuff along the way. So they stopped that at a farmer's house. Mm -hmm. And this farmer was, was about midway from Corner Brook to St. John's. So I guess people used to stop there to find out where the closest uh, motel would be and there wasn't one so he had cots set up in his barn and he would put people up overnight in his barn <laughs> so I see you would never see this anywhere else honestly it's uh, mm -hmm. just uh, just like a like a book I know my mother was so thrilled about that trip where she was able to sleep in a farmer's barn and the next morning they had a nice breakfast ready for them and you know, the, uh, the Newfoundland, uh, and the Newfoundland welcome, it was always there. Well, Our, see, it's just the Newfoundland way, you know, like yeah. you stay anywhere along the way and say, well, we're, we're tired, we're, you know, we're stuck. we'll put you up. <laughs> yeah. Are, are you a Newfoundlander? Yes. Yeah, I was you were. St. John's, actually. 
You were born in St. John's. Yeah, 1971. Uh, actually at St. Clair's. Yeah, I would think so. So, yeah. So I was very excited to see St. Clair's. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we were in Newfoundland, so we did go and get some capelin when the capelin came in. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we, I just loved the, the, the cliffs. And uh, when my family came, the, the boys went fishing off the cliffs there at Logie Bay, I think it was called. Yeah. And of course, the other exciting thing that happened to me when I was in Newfoundland was the iceberg in the harbor. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the icebergs still come into the harbor at St. John's. Yeah. They and do. they get, yeah, they get stuck there. Mm -hmm. and, but we did get to go and to see an iceberg close up and to see sometimes there were little birds living on there or little mm -hmm. things that were interesting to see. But the trouble with the iceberg is when the wind blew, the winter turned, the, the summer turned to winter in a few minutes. So here mm -hmm. I am sitting on this side of the house uh, where the sun is shining. But if we walk yeah. to the other end of the house, we would have the iceberg wind. Mm -hmm. So here we are with the neighbor's children and this, here's my baby there and, and my three girls and the neighbor's daughter was always at our house. So here we are sheltering from the breeze from the from the iceberg in the in the harbor. Yeah. So here's the part where uh, it connects me with our therapy. Mm -hmm. So was this after your um, all your kids went to school or um... no? My, I was, my, my son, Michael, was just, I guess, a year old. Okay. And this was the, uh, the wind, the, the fall of 1960, uh, okay. when my, my son, my husband got organized Okay, that's not when it happened. Let's see, I have to go back. We have to go back to St. Clair's Hospital. After Michael's birth in 1959, I had a delivery uh, complications. Okay. And I had extreme uh, hemorrhaging. Oh, wow. And so I was in the hospital for 10 days, so that was fine. But when, oh, the minute I start, I came home, I started hemorrhaging to the mm -hmm. point that I had to be brought back to the hospital by ambulance. They had to bring the priest in. They gave me extreme unction, which the last mm -hmm. rites. And yeah. I'm an RH negative, and the only thing they had available was plasma for me because they didn't have RH negative blood. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I survived that, but I kept, I didn't, in those days, I, I didn't even know the word trauma, but mm -hmm. I had been traumatized by, by this medical problem. And yeah. uh, after they brought me home from the hospital, I kept playing this back in my mind all the time and I couldn't focus on what I had to do. I, I had four children at home and a young baby, you know. And mm -hmm. so I went to see the doctor and I said to him, look, something's wrong. Uh, I have, I, I'm going to need some pills or something. And he said, oh, Mrs. Jodwin, because that was my married name. Mrs. Jodwin, you're just going to have to learn to relax, he says. So every now, two or three times a day, you should have a cup of coffee and a cigarette. <laughs> 1959, okay. 1959 prescriptions, That's <laughs> right. coffee and a cigarette. <laughs> yes. And I said, well, doctor, that's fine, except that I don't drink coffee and I don't smoke. So you'd better give me a prescription. So he did, he gave me some pills. And I, I immediately 
recovered, but I said to my friend, I said, look at, I, I can't, there's nothing to do in Newfoundland and my family isn't here and I can't be taking pills all the time to make myself feel good. Yeah. So I have to do something and I don't want to go to the mess. All the men are drinking and there's a lot of smoke and I wasn't a smoker. Mm -hmm. So she said, well, you know, the university is starting some adult education classes. Why don't you give them a call? So I called Memorial University and they were offering three adult education courses. They were just starting with adult education in, in 1959. So they were offering blueprint reading, drama, and oil painting. Mm -hmm. Well, my husband was, I wanted something that I could do with my husband. And mm -hmm. for him, he would have liked blueprint reading, but I wasn't interested in blueprint reading. And I was interested in drama, but he wasn't interested in drama. But my husband could draw very, very well. Mm -hmm. And I had only ever done coloring in a coloring book with uh, Crayola crayons. I had never gone beyond a coloring book. But I was willing to give it a try because he was willing to come and give it a try. So we both took this uh, oil painting course. And it got me through my depression. Yeah. You know, it did. But in, in the meantime, I, I, I did it for two years. This is, was my certificate for the first year. I couldn't, I don't know why, where my 1960 certificate ended up, but I kept painting. And the way I did it, don't forget, I had four kids now at home. Yeah. So wasn't a lot of space. So at night when I put the kids to bed, I would open up my ironing board in the living room and I would paint from on the ironing board. So the ironing board was my painting table. And because I, I wasn't good at drawing, I would look into the children's coloring books. And if there was a tree that I liked, maybe I'd copy it and put it in my painting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, that's the most that, that I did. So here's a copy of my first painting. Oh, wow. I did, which I called blue, blueberry pickers because I was in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, he was teaching us perspective and he, everybody did the same type of painting with mountains and tall trees to give perspective. But for me, I look at it and I think it's like, it's like a, uh, a picture of my future and here I have my life in in Victoria with all the mountains here and my life in in the Atlantic Ocean with the blueberries <laughs> here so here I have a little bit of a picture of my life as it is today but with that I didn't know at that time when I did this first painting but what our therapy did it got me through a lot the art got me through things that brought me to our therapy because my, my husband wanted to go hunting. And of course, everybody wants to go hunting and get a moose. Yeah. And so in November of 1960, he went hunting and they shot a moose. And of course we had a freezer full of moose meat and we mm -hmm. loved to eat the moose meat. Mm -hmm. I got pregnant for my fifth child. And so whenever I had cleaning ladies come and help me with my housework and I would give them a bonus of a, a package of moose meat <laughs> to, to send them home with. So moose meat became part of our, 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 our daily food, like moose meat, uh, mm -hmm. codfish, cod cheeks, cod tongues, all of these were wonderful delicacies. But I, I was at that time, I would buy all my Christmas presents to Simpson Sears because going shopping was difficult. And the only store there was, was Bowerings. And it was a very small little store. There wasn't one store in St. John's with an escalator in it or, yeah. you know, so, uh, 
I used to shop with Sears and they had sent me my big box of Christmas presents that I'd gone through. And I, I arranged for my children to be babysat by my, my neighbor. And uh, I went off to, to, to do some returns of uh, goods at Sears. And while I was gone, my husband had a shooting accident in the kitchen. Oh, wow. And uh, he claims he was cleaning the gun and, and it went off. But the Navy saw this as a suicide attempt and treated as such. So he was in the hospital over Christmas. We made a Christmas tree at the hospital and we were back at St. Clair's, you know, St. Clair's kept seeing us all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept painting. This was one way I could keep my, I pull out my ironing board at night and uh, get through Christmas without my husband there. The Navy was not at all supportive. There was no, uh, help for uh, mental help at all, not, no support, whatever. The, yeah. uh, the captain's uh, wife was generous and she cooked the turkey and, and prepared some gifts for my three daughters and sent us that for Christmas. That was the only support we had from the Navy. Mm -hmm. After Christmas, he came home and had pretty well a nervous breakdown and then the Navy decided to send them to Halifax for treatment. So they came and got him and left me, by now it's March and I'm pregnant due in April and I'm in Newfoundland with uh, four children. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with four yeah. children? And I have to go to the hospital for 10 days. That's what they did in those days. They kept you in the hospital for 10 days. Mm -hmm. so I tried as best as I could to, uh, to get people to, to stay with my babies, but you know, even friends have their own family. Taking four children in was a lot. And the only thing that they would suggest to me was social services. And I thought, oh, no, no, no. If my kids get into the system, I'm going to, I'll never be able to get them back out. Besides, my husband's in Halifax. I'm in St. John's. You know, I'm not going to be staying here by myself for the rest of my life. Yeah. So I decided. I had two sisters-in-laws in Halifax. So I decided I'm going to Halifax and I can at least stay for a while with my sister-in-laws till the Navy gives me a place to live. Mm -hmm. So I called the movers and uh, packed my kids up and it was a really, really snowstorm. My friend drove me to the airport. But the fun part of all this was Yes, I should go to this picture here. This was the Christmas, that Christmas, uh, the, the, the Christmas before the accident where you have the romper room little horses there. But mm -hmm. you see the canary here. We had yeah. bought the canary for my youngest daughter from a, uh, a canary person in, in St. John's. And I said to him, what do we do with the canary? And he said, oh, I'll just put it in a box and bring it with you on the plane. Don't, just don't give it anything to eat. <laughs> so I was alone now with four kids on a plane with a box with a canary in it. <laughs> we didn't have uh, the type of uh, checking through your luggage that they have today. Yeah. And so I gave my kids all squeaky toys and uh, stuck the canary under the seat. And if the canary started squeaking, they started playing with their squeaky toys. <laughs> so we smuggled the canary out of Newfoundland. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we came to Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And so that was how my, uh, my son, jo Tony, was born in Muscadabot Harbor, Nova Scotia, because our 
our life in Newfoundland was stopped rather quickly mm -hmm. uh, because of, uh, of my husband's uh, mental problem by then. So here is my son, Michael, that was born in Newfoundland. Okay. This is my eldest daughter, Helen, who was, did her first communion in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And this is the second daughter, Lucille, that broke her leg in Newfoundland. Okay. And this is Diane who injured her eye in Newfoundland. <laughs> this is Tony born in Muscadabit Harbor. Mm -hmm. This is Joe born in Quebec. Okay. And th these are my twins born in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Wow. So as you can see Newfoundland affected a, more than half of my children. Yeah. Yeah. So I say that Newfoundland, in Newfoundland, I learned uh, quite a new experience in life. Mm -hmm. I learned how to bake bread because every day the Newfoundland women in those days baked bread. You could buy bread at the store, but everybody baked their own bread, it seemed. We used to go yeah. and sit in the backyard while the bread was rising. Mm -hmm. And I tried every recipe in the book, but there is no way that I could bake bread. My bread mm -hmm. always flopped. I mean, they have now recipes for sourdough. I, I made sourdough just naturally. I, mm -hmm. I could never make real dough. And then uh, Edith Wareham's mother came to visit and she came from one of these isolated spots in Newfoundland. And she came down and showed me how to make bread. <laughs> and, <laughs> So I learned how to make bread, and I made bread for years and years afterwards in the Newfoundland way. Mm -hmm. I learned how to eat hardtack and make fish and bruise. Okay, and I, yeah. I used to make fish and bruise quite a bit when my kids were growing up, because we all liked that. Mm -hmm. I found that in, in St. John's at that time, if I went to the store for fish, I got cod. Yeah. Fish yeah, and if I went to the store for meat, it was corned beef. Okay. Yeah, and we made jigs dinners, mm -hmm. and uh, on the beach, they called them burlaps, because we would go and boil the food, and it, the way they pronounce boil, it was sounded like burlap. Uh, uh, did my blueberry picking. I would never collected blueberries until I got to Newfoundland. Uh, collecting the, the little capelin on the, the water, eating seal flippers. I learned how to eat lobsters. Okay. People from Ottawa don't know how to eat a lobster. They just eat the tail and the, and the claws. And of course, the most delicious part is the inside of the lobster. And mm. uh, Edith's father owned lobster fishing boats and he would send her barrels of lobster during the season, oh, which wow. she always had too much of. So she shared that with us. So we learned to eat lobster. I learned how to cook and eat moose. Mm -hmm. I, I saw my first iceberg. I got snowed under. <laughs> and with all that, I used the art to, uh, to help me through all those periods of times, which... Uh, I think is what led me to becoming an art therapist. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. I That's think with that, without my experience in Newfoundland, I don't think the art would have been uh, that necessary in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's uh, really good. I love listening to you talk. Like it's, uh, really really fascinating to uh, hear about Newfoundland back then um, from someone you know just came to Newfoundland yeah yeah I would have liked at that time to go to St. Pierre and Miquelon but I had too many babies and too many things happening and mm -hmm. you know three little three little girls were quite a handful yeah and uh, so and then the fourth and then the fifth coming along so it was yeah. a, a two-year period of my life 
where I think I counted it as I was figured it out. In that two period, two year period, we went to the hospital five times. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 60 year period that followed, we went to the hospital six times and two <laughs> of them were, were to have babies. Three yeah. of them were to have babies. So there were only three other things that happened. So it, it was a very intense period of time of my life mm -hmm. without the Newfoundland welcoming, without the Newfoundland love and smile. I don't know that I would have gone through it as well as I did. Yeah. Because throughout all this time, the Newfoundlanders were there, the neighbors were there, uh, even the doctors. Uh, the doctors weren't, the doctor that I had for my, the obstetrician I had, he didn't make house calls. But yet, when my husband had his accident, and it affected me quite well, I was uh, seven and a half months pregnant, he came yeah. to the house to make sure I wouldn't lose the baby. And uh, this was something his doctors weren't doing anymore. Yeah. The other thing is to remember that in 1959, there was no national health pro uh, program. Yeah. So we had like a pediatrician and an obstetrician and a family doctor that we had to pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't making that much money. So in my regular budget month, a month it was $5 to this doctor, $5 to the other doctor. I mean, you wouldn't think of paying your doctor $5 a month nowadays. Yeah. yeah. yeah in those days, it was uh, the amount. And then when we went to the hospital, we had to pay for the hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Because Newfoundland was one of the later provinces to get uh, national health. BC yeah. was one of the first ones, but Newfoundland was one of the later ones. I, I didn't check out to see what date that came in, but it definitely was not national health in 1959. No. So my, uh, like I say, my first painting here, I never looked back. I, I that painting, and I, I did oil painting for years. I did not go into acrylics for a long time. I think yeah. I went into acrylics after my husband left the Navy and we had established ourselves in Gatineau. Mm -hmm. But it was oil painting. And like I say, I used to set myself up on my ironing board and uh, leave the dishes in the sink because I figured I could wash the dishes tomorrow morning. And mm -hmm. uh, I needed to do my painting. Yeah. And I did several paintings then that I gave most of them away. So I don't even have them on my website. Mm -hmm. I never thought of myself as an artist. Yeah. I just painted because I had to. And of course, mm -hmm. in those days, I was sewing too. And we were, we were, uh, cooking a lot we there wasn't there was a supermarket in st john's used to go yeah. shop at the supermarket but uh yeah we we did a lot of our own cooking we did uh, all uh, sewing well i had three little girls so it was too expensive to buy store-bought clothes for them yeah so i i would find some outfit in the catalog that they would fit good in and I'd buy the material and I'd, I'd make it myself to save money. Yeah. But I always found time to paint. Yeah. And uh, the painting is what got me through it. Yeah. This is 1959 and I'm about 27 and I didn't start university training until I was 50 years old. So a good 23 years after this first painting, mm -hmm. I, uh, I took my first art course at university. Yeah. Until then I was pretty well painting on my own. Sometimes I take a little course at the community center, mm -hmm. but I was pretty well just painting on my own. And yeah. uh, it, 
It was when I started university, I didn't think of art therapy, but at that time, one of our local Ottawa newspapers was shutting down. And uh, this was in the 80s. Okay. And they had a full page about art therapy in Montreal that was starting with Michael okay. Edwards was opening the art therapy program at Concordia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we never used to buy that newspaper. And my mm -hmm. husband bought it uh, because it was the last issue. Yeah. And so he figured, oh, I may as well buy the last issue of the Ottawa Journal. And so he brought it home and I started leafing through it. And I saw this about art therapy. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in university then, and I thought, this is it. This is what I want. Yeah, and, because so. this is what you've been doing as self-care for the past. Yeah, for the past 20 years. 23 I've been, years. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. art saw me through me. It saw me through a lot of periods. And before I started uh, university, um, I, I had my twins, and uh, I couldn't go out to work, so I decided to start a home daycare. And mm -hmm. I used to get the kids to make Play-Doh and uh, to do things like that, to keep them quiet. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things that when I applied for my art therapy program, I talked about the Play-Doh with the children, and I talked about my own self-art, and uh, then they accepted me. Yeah. Yeah, that's so a start, powerful story. Starting from Newfoundland, 1959, mm -hmm. to uh, Victoria, BC, 19, uh, 2021, is my journey uh, with art therapy, really. Yeah. Uh, because the, my art has always been spontaneous art. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only after I started uh, doing my Bachelor of Fine Arts that I really got into understanding more art uh, principles. Uh, before yeah, then, yeah. I just, I just, it was just all spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So it's been a wonderful journey. And, and I'm so happy to let people know that it started in Newfoundland. Yeah, uh, that's, and I tried so hard when I was uh, working with Kata to get a conference in Newfoundland, but at that oh. time there was only I think it her name was Bev King. Yes. Yeah, there was only her there, and she tried to get other mental health professions to join her to create a conference, but we there wasn't enough support. Mm -hmm. uh, to get enough people to come there. So when they decided to do it in Cornerbrook, I was so thrilled. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, we would have it in Cornerbrook. Well, hopefully when the pandemic restrictions lift and people are able to travel again, you'll come here and tell people yourself that you um, really, oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> I know uh, Allison too. Yeah, I thought, well, yeah. since I have family now in Cornerbrook, yeah. I just realized I should have had this on, on this mode of, of showing it. Oh, it mm. doesn't matter. It's done now. Uh, this is the way it'll have to be. But uh, yeah, I, uh, 